checking. This is for the sync audio. I'm super happy to have Vinay Gupta with us today. Um, Vinay is a software engineer, a cryptocurrency expert. He launched um, the blockchain platform Ethereum in 2015, which I, I think he just project managed. Okay, okay. Um, Vinay is a collapsonomics theorist, although uh, when I was on the phone to him, I wrongly attributed uh, that to someone else. But maybe that's a compliment because it means you know your ideas are out there in the world. Um, He's an expert in failed states, environmental collapse, and other things that can go wrong that we haven't thought of yet. He's kind of a, a professional pessimist. Those are my own words. Um, he's done consulting work with the Ministry of Defense, the Pentagon, and uh, I'd like to know how that went. I'd like to know more about that, to be honest. Um, he's the inventor of the Hexier, uh, which is an open source uh, uh, refugee shelter. Um, so yeah, he's interested in how technology can help the lives of the poorest first. Um, so yeah, he's here to talk about what it means to think the future and how you go about doing that, among, I'm sure, other things. So without further ado. Oh, sorry, I have a Swiss keyboard, so uh, that is why I'm hmm? uh, uh, Yes, yeah, it's... Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> there we go. Okay, th this is some people building one of my houses. Um, so, I'll, I'll talk about the house in a little while. Uh, but I think, given the audience, we ought to talk first of all about time. Uh, because theoretically I'm here to talk about the future. Um, so, I want to start with a, a story about Mao. Um, I, th I don't think this story is true, but the story is that he was once asked by the French what he thought of the French Revolution. Uh, and the answer was, too soon to tell. Right. So uh, I'm an Indian, uh, half Indian, half Scottish. Um, the Indian half of my family stayed in the same place for roughly a thousand years and spent most of their time teaching in universities. Uh, the Scottish half of my family has no idea who they were or what they were doing past about 200 years ago. And even that 200 years is very vague because they've lost records and they've lost memory. The time scales that different cultures operate on are completely different. So when we start talking about the future, the question is whose time scale are we thinking about? Are we thinking about the future on a very short line Western time scale, where 25 years is a long time? Or are we thinking on an Asian time scale? where I was taught meditation techniques which are said to be six to 8,000 years old. Right? Two completely different conceptions of the future. Are we thinking 500 years or 1,000 years ahead? Or are we thinking in terms of two, three, four year cycles? Does this make sense as a starting point for thinking about the future? Right? So um, recent history, right? 1,000 years ago, French Vikings invaded London uh, and took over a loose agglomeration of feudal states which became known as the United Kingdom. Right? We call that the Norman Conquest ha happened in 1066. Right? And that's really, for most purposes, the start of English history. Right? Beyond that, it's not really England, it's a conglomeration of other units, the languages are different, there's very little historical continuity for any structure in British society pre-1066. Bits and pieces of the church, bits and pieces of local tradition, but that's basically where the clock starts. And the thing that you currently think of as being European civilization with science and industry and all the rest of that really only goes back about 400 years. Prior to that point, they were all farmers. Nothing else was happening. Do you get a sense of how short this history is compared to Chinese history? Right. When you guys were taught Chinese history in high school, how far back did you go? Right. What was the year that Chinese history was taught to you as a start? Say again? No, no, I mean, that's asking that to talk. 
How, how long did you say? 5,000 years ago, right? So your model of history that you were taught as a child goes back 5,000 years. The European model of history that they're taught as kids goes back maybe 1,000 years, maybe 2,000 years or 2,500 years if you're Italian, right? We think of the Greeks as being the kind of origin of civilization, and that's really, what, 2,500, 3,000 years ago, right? And you, know, you have bureaucratic institutions in China which are twice the age of European cities, right? So when it comes to thinking about the future, we have completely different dialogues in different cultures because we have completely different models of the past. Uh, has anybody spent much time in America? Okay. When they teach American history, how far back do they start? Right? <laughs> Right, 1776, you know, when they have the revolution, maybe 50 years before that. So they go back at most 300 years, and that's American history, right? From a Chinese perspective, 300 years ago is the day before yesterday, <laughs> right? So imagine what it looks like to be an American where history only started 300 years ago, and everything is fresh and new, and the world can be completely transformed and changed, and you can make your own stand and define what will happen, right? Versus being Chinese or Indian, where the story starts many thousands of years ago, and the present is very small and very short. If you're an American and you live, you know, let's say 75 years, you're going to live for a quarter as long as America has existed, and it's a quarter of history, right? That's equivalent to being a thousand years old as a Chinese person. So the cultures completely model time differently. And because they model time differently, they model the future differently, and they model progress differently. Right? The Americans run extremely quickly because they have no past, and therefore they have no real sense of the future. If you say to an American, 500 years from now, this is like saying to a Chinese person, 15,000 years in the future. The scales are completely different from one culture to another. Now, does that explain a lot of the differences that you see between Chinese, European, and American culture? Just the length of the history. Right. Totally different models of how things work. And this goes all the way through um, things like what people educate their children to do, how we think about our heroes. Right. In America, there are no historical figures of no beyond 250 years ago. Right? There are no great heroes of history because they have no history. They're only the great heroes of the day before yesterday. And what this gives is <clears throat> an enormous attachment to the present. Right? If there's a single defining American trait, it's that Americans live right here and right now. They don't think about 20 years in the future. They don't think about 100 years in the past. Everything around them is continuously built and torn down and built and torn down and built and torn down. There are practically no 200-year-old buildings in America, even though the country is 200 years old. Because everything is built and torn, built and torn, built and torn. Now, this raises the first big question that I want to pose today. Is something which is 200 years old justifiably called a civilization? Simple question, right? How old do you have to be before you get to be a civilization, right? What if America is just a trend? What if Europe is a cultural movement, right? What do you have to put on the table before you get the title civilization? How old do you have to be? How stable do you have to be? What kind of endurance do you have to show before civilization is the right word to describe what you are? You see the question that I'm raising? Um, the folks that destroyed Rome were called the Goths, right? And the Goths came in and invaded Rome. But that process of Goth invasion of Rome happened over probably two or three hundred years. It was wave after wave after wave, and Rome declined very slowly during that period. That's about as long as America has existed. Right? You see the question that I'm raising? We're in a position right now where the world is in a state of economic and ecological collapse, 
largely because of the enormously intense consumption patterns that you see in Europe and America. And those consumption patterns have spread to the rest of the world among the elites. But for the most part, this pattern of consumerism and hyperconsumption is a product of Western civilization. And Western civilization is only 200 years old. There's no thought for how are we going to continue to farm this land in 500 years, because 500 years is an inconceivably long time in the future. I mean, I suspect that there are areas in China where the model of agriculture thought hundreds of years into the future, thousands of years ago, which is why the land is still fertile. Right? Certainly that's true in India. There are farms in India where they've been doing the same thing in the same way, you know, for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, and the land is still fertile because they took good care of it. In the entire central section of America, the, sto the soil has basically ceased to function as a biological system, and it's more or less just used as an absorbent mat for pouring fertilizer and pesticide into it. It doesn't actually function as a biological system at anything like the level of productivity required to grow food. Certainly not the quantities. So, as we get into the rest of this century, my expectation is that the century will be defined by a very hard conversation between the old cultures and the young cultures about who gets to make decisions in the world. Because frankly, these guys are clowns, right? You know, as an Indian, I look at what Western civilization has done with the resources that it stole from my country, 45 trillion pounds of most recent estimates, right, over the entire period of Indian colonization. What did they do? Has anything that great been created other than vaccines and maybe atomic reactors? Really not very much has gotten done. Right? And this kind of shifting of perspective, I think, is the critical trend that we're going to see over the next hundred years, which is to say over your lives. In all probability, the change in position. Can we something about those folks? Yeah, yeah. Um, the change in positioning between uh, European and American culture and the rest of the world is going to happen over topics like climate change, over topics like deforestation. Hey, you guys are consuming the vast majority of the world's resources with a very small part of the world's population. We have a problem with that, and we achieved sustainability thousands of years ago which is why our civilizations are many thousands of years old. Your civilization has not yet achieved sustainability, which is why you appear to be destroying the planet. Because nothing says sustainable like 5,000 years of continuous history. Right? I mean, is that not what sustainability looks like? You could keep doing it year after year after year and nothing collapses. Does this make sense? Can I see how this looks? Um, so now I want to talk about lifespan. Right? Um, let's see, looks like most of your what, 25 or younger, probably. Like that. Okay, so uh, raise your hand if you expect to live to be 75. Right. You guys all expect to die before 75? Why are you pessimistic? <laughs> If you expect to live until at least 75 years of age, raise your hand. That means all of you, unless you think you're going to die really soon, put your hands up. Okay. Right. How many people think they're going to live to be 100? Okay. Okay. 150? 150? Anybody for 150? Okay, good. 200? 300? 400? 5. Um, so, life expectancy in America uh, in 1900 was 45 years old. Life expectancy doubled for Americans in the 20th century. In many other places over the 20th century, life expectancy tripled. So if life expectancy doubles again, okay, 
if life expectancy doubles again in the uh, 21st century, it's reasonable to expect that you would have lifespans of around 150 to 200. So that means that you will see all of the 21st century and most of the 22nd century. Is anybody ready for that? Right? You have a cultural model where you think you're going to live about as long as your grandparents lived, but actually the entire scientific and technological apparatus is oriented around extending your lives as long as possible, and medicine has become unrecognizably amazing. Uh, I have a friend who had shoulder surgery recently, and you know they were doing crazy things to the shoulder. They were going to basically sand off pieces of a bone. And I was expecting him to come back, you know, with an enormous cast and interaction and all the rest of this stuff, and have a six-month recovery period. Instead, he had two cuts, less than one centimeter in size, and the entire thing had been done without opening up the shoulder. They just put in a little drill, did what they had to do, pulled it back out again, and recovery time was a week. Right? And that's happened all across medicine. I have another friend who had one of his vertebrae removed recently and replaced with titanium. They pulled out a vertebrae from his spine. He was walking again in three days. Inconceivable. Right? And that's only 30 years since I first got an understanding of how medicine worked. Right? Only my parents are doctors. Only 30 years. Unrecognizable change. So how good is medicine going to be in 25 years? Genetic medicine? CRISPR, uh, all kinds of abilities to do things like alter the chemistry of the body in incredibly precise ways using things like nanotechnology, the ability to grow new organs when an organ fails and implant it, but it's your own DNA, so there's no rejection. All of this stuff is coming. And this is before we begin to consider really crazy things like uploading your mind or cloning. So minimally, right, unless civilization breaks, minimally, you've got 150 to 200 years. But imagine what the technology would look like in 200 years. At that point, we probably will be able to scan a human being an atom at a time and make an exact replica, but this time without all the faults. Right? We could grow a new body and move a brain into it. We could grow a new brain and move a mind into it, possibly. Right? So it's very realistic to think about this as you're going to be around for multiple centuries. Right? An American today in Silicon Valley, a young American, probably has a lifespan longer than the entire history of their country. Do we have any cultural equipment to handle this? Does anybody know what to do when you have a family reunion and you've got nine generations of the family there? <laughs> People are basically just not going to be dying when we think they're going to be dying. The first, you already see this in um, uh, many countries where the pension systems are beginning to break because they've got enormous numbers of old people that live forever and very few young people. Uh, can anybody think of a country that has that problem really badly right now? Yeah. Spain. Spain, okay, Spain. Uh, Switzerland. Switzerland. <laughs> uh, I was going to say Japan. So already you're seeing countries that are relatively stable, that have good health care. The old people live a really long time. They're not having so many, uh, people aren't having so many kids. And as a result, you wind up with a massive distortion in the old model, which was few old people, many young people. Now, China went through that transition 30, 40, 50 years ago. Right? Very rapid transition. Most of you will have families where there are much fewer uh, uh, many fewer young people than there are old people. Right? And everybody is going through that demographic transition at different paces. But those young people are also likely to live incredibly long. Right? So what I'm suggesting here is that the fundamental structures of human culture are changing because of technology in ways which reach right inside of the family unit. Birth control, life extension, low infant mortality, pension systems, all of these systems together are changing how we relate to the world and how we relate to each other at a super deep biological level. Right? If you had taken you know, a magic pill 
back to any previous culture and given it to them, and their people have lived 150 or 200 years rather than 60 years, imagine how that would have changed everything about that culture. Everything would have been turned inside out. And that's what's happening to us right now. Right, right now, our culture is turning inside out because we're going through a series of changes where technology changes how our bodies work in ways which cause us to live much longer and far fewer children. Where do we look for guidance on how to manage a world which works this way? What source can you look to for some kind of intelligence that will allow you to understand how to comprehend a world which has lifespans at these kind of levels? And I don't think there is any. So we're in a position where our entire species is being confronted by a completely unprecedented situation, which is the sudden rapid increase in the length of life. And that changes everything about our debates. Everything is transformed. Uh, I'm going to pause for a moment for any questions. Any questions so far? OK. Um, so let's move on to the next thing. Uh, I've had videos playing here of this refugee shelter. Um, so let me go back. So, in 2002, uh, I got very interested in the topic of climate refugees, and I designed an emergency shelter for climate refugees. Um, so the point of this thing is that the walls are 1.2 by 2.4 meters which is the standard size for everything which is made uh, in a panel in industrial production. All of your cardboard, all of your hardwood, all of your plastic sheets, aluminium sandwich panels, all that stuff comes in that size. So the wall is just six pieces that size put on their sides. And then the roof pieces are half sheets. So you take one of these pieces, four feet by eight feet, 1.2 by 2.4 meters, you cut it in half, you put the two pieces together, you get a roof. So what that means is you can design reasonable housing for $250 a unit, um, with the entire production process being that you cut six sheets of material in half, and then you fasten all the pieces together into a small house. Um, this thing was designed with the expectation that it was going to take 30 years to go from a prototype to a fully deployed global capacity. Because the need will be maybe 50 million units of housing of this kind or better. Right? And to go from one unit to 50 million units, you can't ramp production that quickly. All the people that you have to convince that this is a good idea before they'll do something about it have to be convinced. People have to take years and years and years to get used to the idea. The institutions and the bureaucracies, typically you have to have a rollover of staff where people leave and then younger people take over before you see radical shifts in how people uh, use new technology. The humanitarian world, like the United Nations, changes very, very slowly. So having designed this, the question was, how would I, I manage working on a project continuously for 30 years? How do you keep something funded for 30 years? If it's a company, it would be very unusual for it to last for 30 years. Most companies, they grow, they get acquired, they get bought, products get sold to somebody else, uh, you know, or they go bankrupt, or people just quit doing them and do something else. 30 years is a long time for a company. Uh, the average company is only in Fortune 1000 for seven years. Uh, big companies don't stay big very long, the exceptions <coughs> are very, very rare. Um, charities, similar dynamics. Only the biggest charities last a really long time. Most of the smaller charities, relatively short time periods. Also, charities don't scale. Even the biggest charities in the world are not very big compared to companies. Certainly none of the charities have enough money to make 50 million houses. So if I start with a charity, I might have wound up with five or six employees, and it might have been stable for one or two decades. But at the end of that process, we'd probably have only built 50 or 100,000 houses. Doesn't work. Um, so what I decided to do 
was run this as an open source project. So like Linux or like Wikipedia, no copyright, no patent, available for people to do whatever they like with. Um, once this was set up, um, because the intellectual property was given away, lots of other people began to build it. Um, raise your hand if you've heard of a thing called Burning Man. So uh, Burning Man is an American festival where the whole of Silicon Valley uh, and many other tech people from lots of different walks of lives and an increasingly large number of kind of Los Angeles types, you know, the actors, the actresses, and the musicians, come into the middle of an enormous blazing hot desert to have a party. And this thing goes on for about a week, and it's possibly the world's best installation art festival. Uh, enormous machinery, huge vehicles which have been decorated to look like a variety of things, pirate ships, dragons, and so on. And it's basically where Silicon Valley goes to recharge its batteries. Roughly 70,000 people go every year. Roughly a quarter of those people stay in this shelter or a descendant of this shelter called a shift point. Um, as a result, every time Americans go into this crazy future landscape, um, they're getting exposed to a crazy future idea. Um, so what I'm attempting to do is engineer large-scale cultural change by slowly working the idea into society as if it was normal. Oh, that thing has always been here. How else would you solve the problem? So rather than branding it as new, exciting, amazing, crazy, you can make a lot of money doing this, the attempt has been to basically disguise it as something which has always been there, and it's the obvious way of solving the problem. It's an attempt to kind of quietly cause the idea to be adopted without showing people that it's new and exciting. And this is a perspective shift, because normally when innovations are pushed, the innovations are pushed very, very, very hard. People want you to think about the great new thing, and they want you to push forward in a very sort of directed way. This is a kind of ambient innovation. The idea is simply that it turns up in places, and it's adopted as a norm, which is much more akin to a standards process. Um, technical standards are built this way all the time, where somebody will propose something as a new standard, and then that new standard will be ratified as like, okay, here's the standard for email, you know, here's the standard for web pages, here's the standard for video, image compression, and the standards are put out without much fanfare, and then people are gently encouraged to adopt the standard, and after a few years, the standard has become standard. If you're going to do a refugee house, why wouldn't you do the cheap and easy one? It's standard. It's always been there. And this, again, is part of the difference in approach when you think about a project which will take 30 years versus a project which is going to take three or four years. So if I'd started this and I said, I'm going to give this five years and I'm going to get as much as I can done in five years, and then after that, if it isn't a huge success, I'm going to go and do something else, I would have taken a completely different approach. It would have been a venture capital funded project. I would have spent a bunch of other people's money building units. I would have pushed super hard to tell everybody it was amazing. I might have gotten a couple of little pilots done. And then in all probability, it would have stopped and nothing else would have happened because it would simply have run out of energy and money. Because it would move too quickly and it wouldn't have been sustainable. Uh, and when I decided I was going to do this, I was 30. So when I was 30, I made a plan for my next 30 years, which was going to be get this thing to scale and deliver. Can anybody imagine having a 30 year plan? Turns out, if you have a 30-year plan, you live really differently from if you don't have a 30-year plan. Right? Does a 30-year plan sound like a long time? Yeah. Yeah. Not if you're going to live two or 300 years. Yeah. You see? Right. Time scales are completely different because of technology. And that means our planning for our futures has to be completely different because of technology. I can't imagine what the world is going to be like in, let's say, the year 2300, but I think there's better than a 50-50 chance that I'm going to be in the world in 2300. 
because why wouldn't that be? Life expectancy continues to increase. Medical technology continues to get better. Genetic medicine continues to get better. There are already protocols for life extension drugs which will prove roughly 25% on the lifespan of a rat. And I'm sure that a lot of people in Hollywood are taking that stuff. Has anybody seen a recent picture of Arnold Schwarzenegger? Right. 70 years old, looks like maybe a slightly battered 50. Right. And he can still bench press a car. Is that natural? Is that exercise? Is that drugs? Is it all three? He's got the best medicine in the world. He doesn't seem to be aging very quickly. And that's very common in Hollywood because they have a lot of specialist medicine. Um, so what would it look like not to have a 30-year plan, but a century-long plan? Right. What does it take to be the best in the world at something when people have a century to practice? Right. I mean, take something that doesn't change much. Uh, Indian classical dance. Right? Indian classical dance hasn't changed very much in a really long time, right? I don't even know how long, I have a cousin that teaches it. They're referring regularly to texts that are, yeah, more than a thousand years old when they're working this stuff. Um, I don't know very much about Chinese culture. Calligraphy might be similarly old in China. Um, does anybody know sort of how old the oldest Chinese calligraphy that you have is? The stuff you go and see in museums or private collections? Could easily be a couple of thousand years. Right? Certainly a thousand years. Um, so if you were going to become the best in the world at something like Indian classical dance, in a world where people live hundreds of years, you'd have to start practicing now with the expectation that you were going to be learning for six or eight decades. You could spend literally the same amount of time that your great grandparents lived just being a beginner in a world where people live for centuries. Do you see how weird this is? Like, it's deeply weird. I mean, we've been living about this long for a really long time. Right? Although the average life expectancy in the US in 1900 was 45, the people that made it to 45 tended to live till 60, 70, 80, and that's the same way that they do now. It's just a lot of people died younger than that. And that's true if you go back 1,000 or 2,000 years, the oldest people <coughs> still lived 70 or 80 years old, it's just far fewer people made it that long. But the change which is happening because of all this medical technology isn't that you're going to live till you know, 80 or 90 and that will be it. It's that that 80 or 90 ceiling will continue to lift faster than you age. So the, the age at which the oldest people die will continue to go up faster than you get older. Now, what kind of problems is that world going to face? Overpopulation, maybe, but it seems like most cultures basically slow down the rate at which they're having children enormously, and that slowdown continues to increase. Um, resources, if you have those kind of technologies, probably you can figure out how to stretch the world's natural resources far enough to cover all of those people. Because if you have the kind of technology which can stretch a life to two or three centuries, you certainly able to all figure out how to get people around the planet without destroying the atmosphere in the process. Food, similarly, probably biotechnology, possibly farming. Certainly, if we stop eating an enormous amount of beef, that frees up something like 50% of the world's farm land. Um, what I want to try and point out here is just how alien the future is going to be. And this is before we start thinking about artificial intelligence, or robots, or space travel, or virtual reality, or brain-computer interfaces, or any of the rest of that stuff. Right? I picked a single thing, which is life extension, because it makes the problem obvious. But there are so many other areas where we've got change of this kind happening that it's very, very, very hard to say how it's going to be. How do we conceive of what that future could possibly be like? How can we imagine being a two or three hundred year old person? Right? I mean, I think of myself, you know, how can I imagine being 
a 300 year old man in a world where the distinction between human beings and robots is completely dissolved. You know, where you occasionally ask your friends, so did you start as a person or did you start as a machine? You know, to be honest, I don't remember. And, you know, it's not at all unlikely that this is the kind of future that most of the people in this room will live through will live into. Right? There, there is a fundamental structural change in the fabric of reality wrought by technology. Right? You know, if we think about the mind, what do we really know about the mind? Right? It seems to be tightly associated with the brain. Computer scientists will look at the brain and say, that's basically a computer. If the brain can do it, we can make a computer. Um, in the past 10 years, machine vision has gone from not working at all to being basically perfect. It's really, really good now. So if we have very, very good quality machine vision systems, and we didn't have those systems 10 years ago, um, do you guys use Google Translate for things? I use it a lot. Machine translation was thought to be one of the holy grails of artificial intelligence right the way from the beginning of artificial intelligence in the 1950s or 1930s. Everybody thought a machine that could translate two languages would be an intelligent machine. Now we have Google Translate and the other machine translation systems. We use them all the time. Nobody thinks, wow, that's artificial intelligence, but it is. If the machine understands English well enough to translate it into German and back with basically no loss, did the machine understand the text? What does understand even mean in that context? So we got vision, we got translation. Uh, all kinds of amazing things happening with digital art. You've all seen pictures where they've taken the style of somebody like Van Gogh and then applied it to a photograph. All of that stuff is amazing. 20 years from now, what other challenges will be solved? 30, 40 years from now, will computers be able to think like people? If so, do we give them human rights? One branch of development. Another branch of development, um, scanning the brain in increasingly high resolution to enable us to take the knowledge in the brain and represent it in software. Sounds crazy, coming along quite nicely. We already have computer systems that can tell the difference between you thinking about the color red and you thinking about the color blue. And that's today's technology. 30, 40, 50 years from now, computer systems that can scan your thoughts and respond immediately could be common. It could be as common as cell phones. Right. You visualize the room with the lights on or the lights off, and the lights immediately change. You feel like magic. Right. So, 300 year old man with a bunch of friends that might have started out as robots, but everything kind of looks the same now. Right? in a world where you can change the way the material work, works just by thinking about it. Right? And that's not something that happens to future generations. Because of the life extension, that's probably something that happens to us. So the question I want to pr propose here is, what is a good thing to do with your next five or 10 years if you expect to live till three or 500? How do you spend each decade moving towards that kind of unthinkable future? And this is not to say that life will be easy and simple, right? We have to deal with climate change, we have to deal with atomic weapons, we have to deal with human stupidity, which is a really powerful force, right? We have to manage all of the other problems that we have to deal with to get to this future. But nonetheless, right? You spend some of your time and energy planning for a harder future, but you also have to spend some of your time and energy planning for a better future. You need a portfolio. You need some options for things are worse, some options for things are better. So what is a smart thing to do with your time in your 20s when it's the easiest time that you're ever going to have to learn new things? What is a smart thing to do with your time in that time period? Any suggestions? What's a good way of educating yourself for a 300 year lifestyle? 
Is it pop music? Right. Is anything produced in popular culture going to help us manage a 300 year lifespan of people? Nobody's talking about this stuff apart from a few crazy people in Silicon Valley and a bunch of scientific researchers that are working on the underlying technologies. Um, so my suggestion is that there's a huge amount of value of looking at the life experiences of people from the distant past. Because if you read something that was written 500 years ago or 1,000 years ago or 2,000 years ago or 3,000 years ago, the human experience has changed enormously from those people's lives to our lives. Total transformation has occurred in the material environment. Total transformation has occurred in the psychic environment. In the, in the intellectual environment. But something about human nature appears to be unchanging for those time periods. Right? I, I can uh, read translations of many, but translations of very old Indian texts, and I recognize all the patterns of thought and all the attitudes to life. That material is still current across two and a half thousand years. Right? Um, there's a renewed interest in Silicon Valley in the Greek philosophy of Stoicism. That material is also about two and a half thousand years old. So the more we reach back into the fundamental structures of human experience, the more we can look forward into this world of massive discontinuous change in a way that will allow us to begin to focus on what is essential at a deep enough level that surface changes like life extension don't cause us to lose our bearings philosophically. Because we don't want to be in a position where we lose perspective on our own lives just because we begin to live far longer than anybody expected. Does this sort of make sense? Right? You're looking for things which are constant over such a long period of time um, that even as the world begins to move forward, those constants don't change so fast that you lose orientation. Um, and this is essentially uh, a process for philosophers. Right. The people that have thought most about the fundamentals of human life are philosophers, and they're probably the people that have the most to say about the long-term trajectory of human beings. Uh, the other group that are worth thinking about when we think about this at this scale are artists. <laughs> But for whatever reason, we've generally preserved far more of the philosophy from the ancient past than the art. You know, we've got entire books that are thousands of years old from the philosophical tradition, like all the stuff we've got from Plato. Um, but we've got far, far, far less of the artistic stuff from the same period. Actually, the Greek stuff, we've got a lot of Greek plays. We've got a whole bunch of Greek tragedies. But it's very rare for us to have large volumes of artistic work from the distant past. I don't know how much of the old Chinese stuff you have. It may be tons, it may be very little. But certainly we've got very little of like Roman popular culture. We have no idea what they used to sing in cups. It's a reasonable question, right? What did Romans sing when they got drunk? We don't really know. Um, I don't think there's anything else I should cover at this level before we get down into the detail. Um, does that about cover it for this kind of high level type of stuff? Anything else we ought to talk about? Uh, well, we also have to talk about uh, distance. Right? So the other thing that comes up here in a big way is uh, time relates very tightly to distance. So the faster you move, the closer things seem, because the length of time it takes to get there changes. Uh, if you have access to a modern train network, you could go, what, 100 kilometers in half an hour? 150 kilometers in half an hour? Um, if you have access to you know, nothing but a horse-drawn car, to go the same 150 kilometers is going to take you three or four days. So as we move faster and faster and faster, time begins to subjectively shrink. Uh, when I was a child, if I wanted a piece of information that wasn't in my house, it would typically take me two weeks to get a book through an interlibrary loan. So my time from question to answer was measured in sort of 10 day chunks. Now the time from question to answer is a few seconds huge compression. So in all probability, transport will continue to get faster. The interfaces to computer retrieval of knowledge will continue to get faster. Um, 
even if we spread out across the solar system, in all probability we'll take the entire knowledge base with us. Um, even if you're traveling quite long distances between planets, um, time will still be relatively short. It's not until you start going to other stars that you begin to talk about very, very slow travel now. Right? Even, even with the most ambitious systems that we've imagined, it's still going to take something like 20 years to get to the nearest the star and back. And that assumes that you're going to use a continuous chain of atomic weapons detonated behind you to propel your ships. It's called Project Orion. It was invented in the 1950s. Uh, and it would have allowed us to send probes to other stars by the mid 1980s. They just didn't build them. Um, for some reason. Probably all the atomic weapons. Uh, 13 nuclear bombs to blow a ship from the ground in orbit. Does that sound like a good idea? <laughs> it's pretty much the only way we know how to do it. I mean, you, you, the, the ships in the Project Orion system, and this is a real thing. We've got all the papers, we've got all the studies, we have all the science. Um, the ships in the Project Orion system are the size of cruise liners. So you have these enormous ships that you would literally build in a shipyard. They're gigantic. Uh, and then underneath them, you put a sort of 1,000 ton cast iron plate with big springs between the ship and the plate. And then you put the nuclear bomb under the plate. The numbers work. Perfectly practical. If you can get people to do it. So, yeah, the last thing I want to say basically about this scenario is in a world that has these kind of options technologically, in all probability, at least some people will try and get to other stars to take a look around and see what's going on. So the one thing that might counterbalance this sense of incredibly long life and you know the huge changes that come with that is when you start talking about going to other stars, these incredibly long lives suddenly begin to get kind of short. Because if it takes you... 25 or 50 years to get to another star system at the same time you get back, that's a third of your lifetime spent on a ship. And so it's not that all of these challenges go away and everything becomes easy because we have infinite time. It turns out that there is a frontier, there is a horizon so deep that it will take as much time as we can possibly get it because the longer your lifespan, the further you can travel out into space before you die. And I don't know how much human beings will choose to make those kind of journeys. But based on our history, I'm sure that at least some people will choose to go, if only to say that they did. Okay, good. Um, any questions about what we've covered so far? Good, a few uncomfortable looks, that means we're thinking. Oh crap, what do we do now? Correct. Is the question because you know it's very easy to sleepwalk your way into the future, right? You know we don't really notice technological change. We have some great mechanisms in fact of not noticing it. Um, this device over here, on which I am recording this talk, um, they call that phone, right? Now, when I was a child, a phone was bolted to a wall and was connected to a wire to a thing called a phone network. And when you dial the numbers on the phone, you put your finger into this kind of rotating dial. And the, as the dial spun, it was quite, there was a strong spring. And the spring, when it released, generated electrical energy to send a signal up the line to activate the switching equipment to tell them that you wanted to make a phone call. It was an electromechanical device that weighed a couple of kilograms. Right? Then they replaced them with modern phones, which took electricity from the phone network and used it to activate dial pads where you pushed the buttons and made little beeping noises. Right? And every device from that electromechanical lump to this thing over here, every step on that pathway was called a phone. And at no point did people turn around and just be like, wait a minute. That would have been a top 500 supercomputer in the 1990s, which it would have been. Right. That phone in 1992 would have been the fastest computer in the world. Right. But it's still been called a phone that entire period, and they cost about the same as they always did. 
right? Maybe they've gotten a lot more expensive at the high end as they turn into something else. But for the most part, the phones cost what the phones cost. Um, and we do that with everything, right? Pretty much everything that we look at, we continue to use the old names, even though the reality which is underneath the names continues to change very, very rapidly. Um, does anybody go kind of uh, hiking or mountaineering or scuba diving or anything like that, any kind of extreme sport? All of those areas, unbelievable technological change, mostly in material science. So um, you might use the term jacket, right? Um, 50 years ago, that meant something made of cotton that would get wet if you stood in the rain for 15 minutes. And now it means some kind of nanotechnology membrane which will keep you dry for days if you stand under the waterfall. Same name, completely different performance character. And this happens for everything. And the part of the way that we protect ourselves from this very, very rapid rate of change is the uh, enormous tendency to use the same language to refer to completely different objects as time passes. So we produce a kind of insulated shell where we just use the same words, jacket, phone, car, Right? But the actual objects which are being referred to become completely transformed. Uh, has anybody taken a ride in a self-driving car like a Tesla? They're not self-driving all the way yet, but you know the drivers can relax on motorways because the car just takes care of itself. Is that a car? Is that a robot? Is it an artificial intelligence? Is it a new life form? No, it's a car. Cars have always been like that. Well, not really. A hundred years ago, the car required like two people to operate it, and um, you know, practically you needed a mechanic to travel with you everywhere you went because the thing would break down every twenty miles. Total systems transformation. Um, what is the thing which has changed most over the course of your life so far? Think back to when you were small children. What is the single biggest area of change? Could be something like the health of a parent. If one of your parents got sick or died, that could be a radical transformation. That, that happened to people. Um, there could be radical transformations socially or culturally. You could change countries, like you're here now. Um, you could get into a position where you have some hobby and everything in that hobby changes. Right? If you're a runner, somebody just broke the two hour marathon. That hasn't been um, so, the way that we construct our reality is we only have a limited amount of attention to pay to things. We can only see so much, we can only know so much, we can only model so much inside of our minds. So, for the most part, at this point in history, most of our mental apparatus is used to buffer change. So if the change is too rapid, we find ways of dealing with the change which make it less change, right? We still call this device a phone because it has the capability to make a telephone call. Does anybody actually use their phone as a phone? <laughs> right? To me, it's a weird day when I have to make a phone call. I make maybe two phone calls a month. And when somebody phones me, I'm like disturbed. Like, What's happening? Oh, my phone is ringing. Wait, it's a phone call. You know, it's not a Skype call or a Telegram message or something else where I can just text somebody back and just be like, no, go away, right? It, it's actually a phone call, and it's, it's wrapped in a social convention that existed when I was a child, because when I was a child, when the phone ran, it was an event. Oh, the phone is ringing. You could run over and pick up, oh my goodness, who is on the phone? Right? No caller right couldn't tell what was happening, you had to answer it. And if they didn't, if you didn't pick up the phone, you had no idea who had called you unless they left a message and you know, like you had to buy a separate answer machine. And this is within living memory, and I'm not that old. Maybe I am. Um, so why do we still call it a phone rather than a pocket supercomputer? Right? Well, we call it a phone because the thing that it evolved from is called a phone. And the thing that that evolved from was called a phone, and the thing that that evolved from was called a phone, 
all the way back to the first thing that's called a telephone, which is now probably 100 years old, 150 years old. Right? So the object is replaced by the next more complicated artifact, but we continue to use the same name. Take the term jacket, right? In 15 or 20 years, probably most outdoor jackets will be heated. They'll have battery, they'll have electrical circuitry. When it's cold, your jacket will automatically maintain your body temperature. It could also have active systems like electrostatic membranes or fans that will take uh, heat away from your body when you're too hot, take moisture away from your body. Right. And in all probability, right now, that would be more like a spacesuit than it would be like a jacket. The jackets which work that way are associated with spacesuits. But by the time that kind of clothing is commonly worn by ordinary people, I bet you will still call it a jacket. We won't change the name to space, unless you live in space. And even if you live in space, you might still call that a jacket. You know, you're on Mars, you wear your Mars jacket. Your Mars jacket is actually just a jacket, but it's a jacket that works on Mars, which today you call a space. So all of those are mechanisms that we use to protect ourselves from the knowledge of change. Right? Music, right? This term, electronic music. How much has the electronic part changed in electronic music in the past 40 or 50 years? It started very, very mechanical and very, very beeping, right? Beep, 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 right? 1990s era techno, you know, there were about four noises that a computer could make, right? Now, real-time voice synthesis. Artificial intelligence is listen to the music and sing along with the music. Has anybody help her an album called Proto by Holly Herndon? Um, it's an album where a woman sings along with a choir made of robots. And she sings, and they keep up. And it's an entire album that was made this way. It's unbelievable. It's, it's completely strange. Right? Um, the same thing with films, right? You go and see a film. Even a film which isn't a special effects masterpiece, right? Even an ordinary film about you know, people driving around in cars and talking to people, right? Even a romance film or a comedy will be filled with computer graphics, right? You know, if they take a shot on top of the Empire State Building, there's no way of knowing whether the actors were ever there. Um, we still use the term film because one part of the story has changed because you sit there and you watch it. But everything behind that part of the story is completely transformed. So there's a tendency in the way that the human language works when we adapt to culture, that if one part of the system is the same, we still give it the same name that we gave it at the beginning of the process. So if one thing is unchanged, we'll hang on to that name, even though everything else washes out from underneath does this make sense? Uh, think of these artificial food products, right? Things like Huel or Soylent. Right? It's food, but everything in it came from non-food sources. There might be some starch in it that came from a plant, but for the most part, it's actual minerals and trace elements and sugars that were made in a lab, all combined together into a food-like product. We still call it food. We'll still call it food right the way through that process. Right. When you put something in a microwave, you know, is it cooking? People will still call it cooking. Microwave cooking? Well, it's certainly heating. But there's no chemistry going on there. It's all cooking. So, you know, as, as you watch the world, try and have awareness of how language stays the same, but reality shifts underneath the language. Can anybody think of another example of language which is shifting that way right now? I got a good one for you. Right. Um, the term America right, has shifted out of all recognition in the past 20 years. Right. America in the 1990s was as different from America today as phones in the 1990s were from phones today. And that's not true for, for example, Switzerland. Right? Switzerland is really pretty similar to how it was 20 years ago in terms of how it looks at the world and how the people act. America, 
total transformation and not in a good direction. Right? The term United Kingdom, right? We could break into half a dozen countries in the next five years. Right? Literally half a dozen countries, not just three or four, half a dozen. Right? And yet we still have this sense that it's the same political entity that's existed for a thousand years. Right? Um, now, let me see if I can get this straight out. Um, the other way that we see this is definitions of normal. Right? So uh, if you walk into a building and the building is like a basement, so there's no cell signal and there's no Wi-Fi, is that space normal or is that space broken? Right. So 20 years ago, if you walked into a basement and there was no telephone, that was no big deal. If you walked into a basement and there was no telephone signal, that was not unusual. <coughs> and it didn't matter that much. Now, if you go into a basement and there's no Wi-Fi and there's no cell signal, it's like being cut off from the universe, and it's like being in a weird, creepy place. Like, hey, I'm down here in the basement, there's no Wi-Fi, I can't talk to anybody, I'm completely alone here, whoa. Right. Now, that didn't used to be a reaction to being in a place with no radio signals. Right. If you go back 200 years ago, the entire world had no radio signals. Right. So when did it become normal for us to expect radio signals to keep us connected to an invisible grid containing the messages from all of our friends as a normal part of life? When did that become just how the world is? Right. And it's slowly getting more that way. Um, I mean, does anybody have that experience? If you used to go someplace and there's no cell signal, you think, wow, this place is broken? Does anybody have that experience, or is that just me? Right. Like if you're in an airport and the Wi-Fi is down, Right? And you know you don't want to pay twenty-five dollars a minute for roaming, like oh, cut off. Right? So what happens is that we wind up with new infrastructure which becomes normal. Right? Um, running water, right? Running water is pretty recent. Right? Uh, I was talking to somebody yesterday who grew up in Tennessee in America in the nineteen seventies, and they didn't have running water in their house until the mid nineteen seventies. Right? When they were a small kid, no running water, it was all well water, you had to pump it. Right? And that was Tennessee in the 1970s. Now, if you go into a building like a hotel and they don't have running water, the building is broken. Right? Um, electricity. Electricity wasn't there 100 years ago. Now, if you go into a building with no electricity, the building is broken. You go into a place with no Wi-Fi, the building is broken. You go into a place where there's no cell signal, the building is broken. So, what constitutes a building what makes you think that you're in a place where things work and everything is correctly organized changes over time. If we went back 500 years ago and you went into a building and there were no servants chopping the wood and making the tea and keeping the fires going and sweeping the place and all the rest of that stuff, you would say the building is broken. Now most of that work is done by machines, vacuum cleaners, central heating, air conditioning, kettles. The definition of what makes the thing normal changes over time. Right? So when we say we go to somebody's house, the implicit mental model that you have of somebody's house includes water, electricity, Wi-Fi, robots to do a whole bunch of manual labor. And if you went to somebody's house and they didn't have those things, they would be weird. Right? If I invite you to come to somebody's house, like let's go to my friend John's place. And we go to John's place and John lives in a house with no electricity, no running water, no toilet, no internet, no electrical lights. Right? John is a weirdo. He lives in, in a cottage. He lives in a hut. It's no longer a house. Right? So that drift in norms, the word house, the word home, unchanged. The actual thing which those words refer to, changed. Now, city, country, car, computer, planet, all of those words are similarly in a process of transformation. When we say the word superpower, right? Right now that means things like nuclear weapons and aircraft carriers and a huge industrial base. 
in 30 years, superpower might mean that you've got a single artificial intelligence which manages the entire economy and most of the national security apparatus. Country. Uh, the government of Estonia, which is a small country kind of uh, between Russia and Finland, pretty much. Um, Estonia knows that they're at a substantial risk of losing their land to Russia. If Russia decides that they want to retake Estonia, because Estonia used to be Russia, if they want it back, you know, they could take it back very, very easily. Estonia is tiny and has no military. The Russians could basically show up in one tank with one flag and they would be Russian again. Um, but the Estonians keep all of their government records in German. Right? They, they have a very strong electronic government program for all the documents about identity and taxes and business registrations and all the rest of that stuff, educational systems, all of the government record systems are stored on servers in Germany, right? backups. Right? And the Estonians have a clear idea that if they lose the land to the Russians, the government of Estonia will continue to operate as an electronic entity, and eventually the Russians will get bored and give them their land back. It might take 25 years, but Estonia as a country would continue to exist because they think that the administration is more important than the land. This is a genuinely weird situation. Right? And yet they're probably right. right. Certainly some cultures which have become refugees have managed to hold their cultures together for very long time periods because they were able to hold on to a religious identity or a language for centuries and then at that point they could go back to the old ways once they were able to go back. That happened a bunch in Europe to different cultures. Um, so... What I want to leave you with is an understanding that if you don't watch language very carefully, language will slide out from underneath your understanding and you will use words in an unconscious way. Right? Every time we refer to phone and just think phone, right? if you don't have a little bit of alertness, 10 years will go by and the phone will develop some crazy new feature. Right? What is a thing that a phone might do in 10 years it doesn't do today? I'm going to suggest it might fly. Right? The phone and the drone are used in very similar ways. We both use them as cameras a lot of the time. Right? People are carrying drones as a separate device. Here is my drone, here is my phone. But the phone is used to control the drone because the app that runs the drone runs on the phone. Well, you know, if you had a phone that had some water propellers on it and was very light, or a detachable drone that was built into the phone, you would just hold it in space, tell it to fly up a little onto the left, everybody would smile at it, and it would take the picture. Problem solved. So, five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, how long before we think that phones will fly by default? Right? How long before cars will self-drive by default? A car which doesn't self-drive is now a broken car. You can't put a broken car on the road. Are you crazy? Right? What do you mean your phone doesn't fly? Is that a relic? Is it a fossil? How do you take selfies? Right? How do you look for things when you lose them if your house doesn't have a brain? Right? So the tendency for language to drift, right? But for the you know the objects just you know sorry, it really just in the language definitions. The language stays the same, but the objects that the language refers to just drift out is very, very strong. Right? Do you ever get a moment where you're talking to your parents and there's a moment of incomprehension where they tell some story and something doesn't make sense and then you realize it's because it was in the old days and something wasn't the same way it is now? You know? But mom, why didn't you just phone them? Well, because it was before we had mobile phones. Honey. That's a really common one. So, as we go through time on these very, very long lifespans, the thing which will cause us to become unconscious and uncreative is if we continue to use language without understanding that the world is changing underneath us. Right? If you don't think when you see a phone of all the previous things that the phone came from, it's very, very, very difficult to hold on to the reality of what's happening in the situation and you become unconscious. Right? When you just use language in a habitual way without understanding that the objects that language refers to are changing over time, 
then what happens is you lose your grip on reality and you begin to live in a kind of nostalgia bubble. You begin to live in a place which no longer exists because you use the word phone to refer to the phone as it was when you were 20 rather than using the word phone to refer to what's actually happened. Um, do you ever talk to old people and see this kind of slippage? Where they still use the words but the things that the words refer to have completely changed? Do you ever do tech support for your grandparents and try and explain to them what the computer does? Right? Done that. Parents or grandparents? Like, why can't I print the file? Because we don't have a printer. Why don't we have a printer? For the same reason we don't have a fax machine. Right? Has anybody ever used a fax machine? Right? I've used one. I've used one. Right? Younger folks, have you ever seen a fax machine? Right? It was like a photocopier stuck to a modem. It allowed you to photocopy documents by phoning somebody, and the photocopy would come out of their fax machine rather than your fax machine. And at the time, this was revolutionary computerization of the world. Um, so I think that is basically it. Right? That's my note. Right? You're going to live a really long time. The world will get very strange. Uh, language will not update itself to tell you that the world has gotten very strange. So the world will continue to get weirder and weirder and weirder, but language will change. And as a result, it's possible to become unconscious of how much the world has changed in a way that causes your thinking to become kind of ineffective and sloppy. Right? You have to keep looking at the past and measuring where you are to understand how much has happened. And if you don't do that practice of looking at the past and understanding how much has happened, if you don't keep an eye on that change, your mind will basically cover over the rate of change in the same way that it constantly blocks out all kinds of optical artifacts caused by your eyes and just presents you the coherent model of the world, even though the world is not actually coherent. Um, do, you ask, do you guys know about the blind spot? Right? You know, where the place where the nerve enters your eye, there's a little place where you can't see, but rather than showing you a blind spot, the brain just papers over it and pretends it's there. Right, you can do this experiment where you put two crosses on a piece of paper, you move it, and then one of them vanishes. So the way that the brain relates to language and relates to change is that language constantly covers the blind spot so that we can't actually see the world changing around us as fast as the world is changing because we just use the same words to refer to things that we always used. And as a result, we become kind of change blind. <coughs> so my advice, and the thing that I really want to focus on, is don't become change blind, right? Remain alert to what's happening. You know, sometimes you want to look at the past, five years back, 10 years back, read old newspaper articles, look at old technology, go and talk to people that lived through things that happened 30, 40, 50, 100 years ago. A hundred's a bit of a stretch, but it won't be the future, right? So that you can begin to model change as being normal. Because if you don't model change as being normal when you're relatively young, by the time you are fully adult and your mind has begun to harden, change will be surprising and shocking. Because if you model the world when you're young as a static place with a low rate of change, when you begin to realize the world is changing, it can be disturbing. But if you model the world as being a place which is continuing changing and continuing to be in flux, and you go back and look at how much change there's been since you were born and since your parents were born, it can give you a healthier attitude towards change which is that change is constant, and we're constantly navigating and managing change. Uh, and that's it. That's what I have to say. All right. Uh, any questions? What do I think of the relationship between humans and artificial intelligence in the future? Um, so there's an old saying from AI that as soon as the software works, it's no longer called artificial intelligence. Right? You know, uh, route planning, machine translation, image search, and probably two or three other things have become completely routine, but we no longer think of those things as being artificial intelligence, although they very clearly are. Right? Self-driving cars crazy robot artificial intelligence. Oh no, that's just a self-driving car, that's not AI. Um, because people 
are only interested in the part of intelligence, which is a machine that talks to you and says, hi, I'm Bob the machine. I know that I'm a machine. I know that you're a person. How are you doing? And that is a tiny, tiny part of intelligence. Right? If you think about you know, dogs or horses or birds, they're very intelligent. Right? The birds are capable of flying 5,000 miles, and they never get lost. How are they doing that? Right? You know, dogs are capable of telling when a human being is in a bad mood from 30 feet away, and then intelligently adjusting their behavior around that. So there are lots of kinds of intelligence which aren't verbal linguistic intelligence. And the machines are very, very, very rapidly mastering all of those other kinds of intelligence, which is how evolution happened. Right? Verbal, rational, linguistic intelligence is the last kind of intelligence to evolve after everything else has been done. So I think we might see enormously powerful artificial intelligences which don't use language and which are not conscious but are still hugely impacting our lives in the way that we operate. And then I think it's only at the very last stages that you'll begin to get something that has an identity, if ever, right? Because I'm not completely convinced that artificial intelligence will be able to create a machine that says, hey, I'm Bob, and actually knows that it's Bob. I think there is a possibility, I think it's not a strong possibility, but I think there is a possibility that that might not turn out to be something that a computer can do. Uh, but we're just going to have to wait and see on that because it's not really clear which way that goes. Um, but like with machine translation, you know, we really thought machine translation was going to be impossible until you had a machine that had an identity, that understood what had been said, and then understood that it was repeating it to a different audience. And then it, it turns out we just beat that with statistics. So, yeah, my prediction would be that we'll wind up increasingly, you know, joined two complex artificial intelligence systems that we'll use tons and tons and tons and tons and tons every day, but the actual final threshold of the machine which is self-aware is probably a long way out and probably actually not that important. Okay, uh, does that answer your question? Cool. Alright, anything else? The question was, what about the future of empathy? Are we headed towards a global misunderstanding or a global understanding? Um, so I think there are two sides to that, right? I think that having too much empathy is part of what has caused Western civilization to collapse. Um, because we started worrying way more about what people feel than what people do. And that led us to elect politicians that feel like they're doing the right thing, even though they're doing the wrong thing. Uh, and that tendency to worry more about surfaces than facts, I think, comes from uh, too much empathy and too much emotion. I not think enough there's, reason. there's a language thing that's happening here as well. Mm -hmm. What I mean by empathy, I mean, let's say, let's, uh, let's agree on empathy means solving for the poorest for the first. Ah, okay. So let's, let's, say, let's say that that is, and that's a debatable point, but that's important. Right. Reagan would say you do the opposite. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's say that is the issue. Okay, so you're talking about kind of utilitarian empathy. Would, or is the That's world the only going, kindness we're talking about. Yeah, okay. So is the world going to continue to be run in a bad way that causes a lot of suffering? Right. Or is it going to be run in a better way that produces less suffering? Um, ah, wow, that's an easy question. Um, <coughs> so here, uh, well, I guess we're just going to go for it. So... Um, Yesterday, I did a podcast with a couple of very, very bright, chipper Americans from LA, right? Young, optimistic, cheerful media people, right? You know the type, right? So what I said to them is, look, it's much easier to understand the world, right, if you break away from the mythology. So the mythology is that we are civilized people that live in a nice place. And almost every culture tells itself this story, well, we're civilized, refined people, and we live in a nice place, and people are basically nice. But actually, the data really doesn't support this, right? Every culture ignores its poor, 
you know, anytime you make it possible for people to abuse each other, they will. You know, it's a really difficult place to have any kind of persistent, coherent human goodness. So I prefer the narrative, which says that we are basically monsters that live in hell, and we have to work very hard to make the situation around us better, to rise to the level of being even slightly human. And I think that that is a much better fit for how most cultures act most of the time than this idea that we're nice people with a few problems. We're actually not nice people. We are super efficient predators with terrible problems setting limits on ourselves and having any kind of self-control. That's why we're destroying the entire planet to buy consumer goods that we throw away in three years. Right? Only crazy bad people would do that. And thinking of ourselves as being crazy bad people creates much more room for improvement than imagining that we're all basically nice people and then wondering why the world is broken. Because there is this problem, like, if we all basically feel like, well, you know, we're nice people and we, you know, we're, we're civilized people and we live in a nice place. If you think like that, it's not clear where the problems are coming from, right? Whereas if we think of ourselves as being basically like, we're kind of awful and the world is kind of awful, then it's really clear where the problems are coming from. It makes it way easier to do something about them, right? So I feel like part of what has to happen for us to get a better world is that we have to admit that we've been kind of wrong about human nature. Right? And what's interesting to me about this is that on the kind of European and American political spectrum, the left have a very optimistic the left have a very optimistic model about human nature. Right? This is a kind of socialist man thing, you treat people nicely, they'll work together, they're cooperative, all the rest of that. The right wing has a very pessimistic model of human nature. People are awful. And the only way that we can get society to work at all is by setting rules, and we have to accept that the strong will abuse the weak, and that's the nature of the world, but we can stop it being too much. And what I think we need is a kind of new way of looking at this, which accepts that the right was basically correct about human nature, and the left was basically correct about human aspiration. Uh, and there's some very interesting work being done on this by an outfit called Radical Markets, who basically are taking all the machinery of neoliberal capitalism and then trying to implement Swedish model socialism on top of it. And that's really interesting, because I think it begins to break away from the industrial model left-right divide and get into something which is a bit more post-industrial and a bit more flexible. Um, now, I want to talk a little bit about the moral side of this. So, I think all that we can learn from history about human beings is that human beings have not fundamentally changed their basic nature for the whole of recorded history. Right? Very little has changed. Society has changed, structures have changed, environment has changed, education has changed, but the basic human structure is very, very similar. Um, but if we want to get a much nicer world, right? Why don't we automate as much of the work of being moral as possible? Right? If my phone will not, you know, or my credit card, right? If my credit card sends a warning to my phone every time I buy meat, or something that contains conflict minerals from Africa, or something that was made by you know slave labor in Thailand or something like that, right? You know, every time I do something like that, if I get a warning or my card just doesn't let me spend the money, hey, you said you didn't want to do this, I'm not going to let you do it unless you go to your phone and make an override, people's behavior will change. They'll put it back on the shelf. Oh, yeah, I wasn't thinking I bought that by mistake. No, I'm not going to do that. So rather than thinking of like smacking people with a stick until they become nicer, which is most of recorded history, if we just accept that people are just kind of not that great, we can start then building systems to help correct them. Right? Human beings are way not moral enough to live in a nice society in the same way that we're way not strong enough to be able to lift things. So we made a crane to make us stronger. We made a computer to make us smarter. Why don't we also build machinery to make us more moral? Right? To take away the things which make it easy for us to do evil and to make it much easier for us to do good machinery to amplify human morality seems like a logical way forward. And I think that would be largely software and finance. But it might be other things as well. But, you know, on the other track, if we don't start <coughs> automating morality, we're screwed. Right? No way forward. Okay. Um, another question. Uh, 
Somebody? Somebody? Got to have something. Can't be back, yes. Can you say a little more about uh, philosophy and role? Yes. So, not all philosophy, but most philosophy is concerned with things which are unchanging. Right? Most of the philosophers were fundamentally interested in what is eternal, what is static, what is changeless. Uh, some of those philosophers take a track where they assume that there's some kind of realm of perfect, unchanging things, the kind of platonic forms, or the Indian equivalents, you know, all the kind of, uh, you know, the Western track tends to go down that way. Asian philosophy, Buddhism, uh, much more interested in the idea that change is continuous. Right? Everything is impermanent. Bits of Taoism head in that direction as well. So, given that we're in a position which has these ultra-high rates of change and ultra-high accelerating rates of change, um, the philosophers who were looking at the world thousands of years ago would come to very sensible-looking conclusions that we can still relate to tell us that it doesn't matter so much how rapidly things change or how much changes that are human invariants which go back thousands and thousands of years that probably won't be broken by the current round of technological shifts. So the questions about morality, goodness, justice, right and wrong action, uh, the nature of mind, um, the nature of human experience, the phenomenology stuff, all of that stuff stays the same whether you're a 300-year-old being on a spaceship that isn't sure whether it started life as a robot or a person, um, or whether you are uh, you know, a Greek guy living under a barrel you know, begging for food. As one of the most famous Greek philosophers did, Diogenes. Um, and that attempt to find invariance in human experience is part of the reason that I think that English culture has such a reverence for Shakespeare. Because he's far enough back that the language is almost not quite English, um, but all the characters are fully identifiable as modern people. Like, we know people that are much like a whole bunch of Shakespeare's characters, and Shakespeare kind of reinforces on us the idea that not that much has changed. Particularly when you see a modernized production where they've made the language a little easier to deal with, you know, you really begin to understand that these stories are kind of unchanging. Uh, I think that's also a lot of the value in old myths, is that the characters act in ways which are identifiable, and that's very helpful to us in terms of understanding what it is that's going on in those environments. Okay, um, maybe one more question before we wrap it up. Anything? Should we wrap it? Are we done? Okay. Very good. Well, thank you all very much.